What are you gonna do today, Napoleon? Whatever I feel like I wanna do. Gosh! Napoleon Dynamite was one of my first movie obsessions, which I didn't quite realize until I found home footage of me and my sisters where I mostly just quote the movie. Come on, go get some ham! Tina, come get some ham! Napoleon Dynamite has definitely stuck with me in the years since. So I was delighted to find out that my fellow Chicagoan and film critic hero Roger Ebert gave the film an abysmal 1.5 out of 4 stars. There is a kind of studied stupidity that sometimes passes as humor, he writes, and Jared Hess's Napoleon Dynamite pushes it as far as it can go. And Roger Ebert is not the only one who feels that way. Most people do like the movie, but it's not universally loved by any means. Many reviewers on IMDb call it the worst movie they've ever seen. And it has an unusually high number of 1 out of 10s and 10 out of 10s compared to other comedies from the same time. According to IMDb's metadata, Napoleon Dynamite is as polarizing as some of cinema's most divisive movies, which is all the more baffling since the movie isn't political, art house, or controversial. It's a pretty by-the-books, light-hearted high school comedy. So why is that? Why is a simple movie like Napoleon Dynamite so divisive? The answer is more complicated than you may think. It's actually so complicated that data scientists have given the phenomenon a name, the Napoleon Dynamite Effect. As the majority of my viewers know, the internet today is powered by recommendation algorithms. And back in 2006, Netflix was trying to improve their own. At the time, the streaming service offered $1 million to anybody who could enhance their recommendation algorithm by 10%. According to a New York Times article from 2008, when statisticians tried to predict which movies people would like, Napoleon Dynamite was the most difficult of them all. There was almost no way to know how someone would feel about the movie. In other words, Napoleon Dynamite broke the algorithm. This phenomenon became so well known in the statistics community that the Napoleon Dynamite effect has popped up in academic journals to describe any item that adds a lot of uncertainty to a model. So figuring out what makes Napoleon Dynamite so unpredictable literally became the million dollar question. The New York Times article gives a simple answer. It's because the movie is quirky. The movie does share stylistic similarities with other quirky eccentric films, like those by director Wes Anderson. Both Napoleon Dynamite and Wes Anderson movies love awkward blocking, stylized wide shots, and silly editing sequences. He's as skinny as a pencil, as smart as a whip, and possibly the scariest man currently living. You got shocks, pegs, lucky. But Napoleon Dynamite still feels different. The movie has much weirder, less relatable characters. Some critics find Napoleon very unlikable. And I do think it takes more work to find the charm in the world of Napoleon Dynamite than it does in the world of Wes Anderson. So while it's true that Napoleon Dynamite is quirky, I think that sells the Napoleon Dynamite effect short. Other quirky movies around that time period lack the same level of divisiveness. I think the true answer to the million dollar question lies in something deeper. It's weird that people don't talk about aesthetics in cinema. When we describe a movie, we tend to talk about its plot, characters, or setting. We spend a lot less time on the movie's aesthetics, how it feels, its tone, or how it caters to a certain taste. And that's in part because aesthetics are hard to describe, but aesthetics often have a huge impact. Like when Snow White and the Huntsman and Moonrise Kingdom came out a month apart, and because the films have different aesthetics, nobody noticed they're the exact same movie. But it's like, a girl runs away from a strange dynamic in which there's this tension with the blonde evil woman. They both both end up meeting this Boy Scout huntsman who's an outdoors guy. They're afraid of the woods, but then they become attracted to each other and have a slightly strange sexual encounter that then brings them into an Eden. All the while, they're being pursued by a troop of small men <laughs> who hate them at first, but then sit around the campfires and end up helping them and rescuing them and saving them. Because these movies have such different aesthetics, it doesn't matter that they have the same story. They feel like entirely different movies. So story often gets lost inside a strong aesthetic, which is especially the case for Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> Many critics of the film claim the movie has no plot, and even I remembered the movie more as a series of vignettes than as a coherent narrative. But that could not be further from the truth. You know what movie is actually most similar to Napoleon Dynamite? Rocky. Both star a talkative amateur performer, who gets beat up and can't entertain a crowd. They both get an opportunity to compete against the flashy popular guy, and they prepare with lots of training, sweating, <coughs> and a montage. <laughs> Then the underdog performs in the big event and gets a standing ovation. Both movies end exactly the same. Right after the big performance, the hero reunites with his shy love interest as the movie fades to black. 
Also, both movies feature lots of animals, have a strong sense of location, and people drink raw eggs. Many critics use Rocky as a classic example of the hero's journey, but that framework can just as easily apply to Napoleon, who actually undergoes a big transformation in the movie. At the start of the movie, nobody has Napoleon's back. His grandma abandons him, Kip won't pick him up from school, and Uncle Rico sabotages his relationships. When he visits Rex Quando, he realizes what he's looking for. No more flying solo! You need somebody watching your back at all times! In a rare moment of vulnerability, Napoleon reveals he wants that from Pedro. So you got my back and everything? What? Never mind. Over the course of the film, Napoleon earns that respect by helping Pedro become class president. He learns that for someone to have your back, you have to have theirs. But this hero's journey was completely lost on many viewers, and that is the power of aesthetics. We understand Rocky's journey because the film has a serious gritty tone, so it's natural to notice his progression and his desire to make a name for himself. So all I want to do is go to distance. And many viewers, including me, didn't notice that same inner story in Napoleon Dynamite. It's not like I cared about the movie's plot when I was eight years old. I just liked that Napoleon talked funny. Good morning, people. I can get some dinner. And that's by design. The film doesn't motivate the viewer to root for any particular outcome in the same way that a movie like Rocky does. It doesn't have the swelling movie score or dramatic symbolic moment that portrays Napoleon as a classical hero. It instead has a flat, objective portrayal of life in Idaho. It doesn't tell the viewer how to feel. And the lightweight tone and over-the-top performance performance by John Heater disguise his epic character arc. So the movie may have a classic plot, but it's most famous for its uniquely weird aesthetic, one more off-putting than a Wes Anderson film. But the movie didn't become a hit just because it was weird. Then it probably would have ended up just another niche indie movie. Napoleon Dynamite connected with lots of people because it had a fresh combination of the weird and the conventional. You can find Napoleon funny when he makes up outlandish stories to try to sound impressive, and you can also root for him when he finally does get to accomplish something meaningful. Napoleon Dynamite became a hit because it broke the expectation that weird movie aesthetics must have a weird plot, and classical movie aesthetics must have a classical plot. And I think that's the same reason Napoleon Dynamite broke the algorithm. The movie is hard to categorize. Some people simply don't resonate with the conventional story and get turned off by the goofy aesthetic, but those who do resonate with it absolutely love it. And if humans have such an unpredictable hit or miss relationship with the film, then of course an algorithm would too. Napoleon Dynamite bridges the gap between the indie lover and the casual moviegoer, but it's also not the kind of aesthetic and story combination people are used to. It's harder for a viewer to make sense of Napoleon Dynamite compared to movies whose story matches their tone, and that phenomenon made the movie a statistical risk. The Netflix algorithm couldn't predict how someone would feel about such a unique combination, and media companies don't want risk in their algorithms. They want movies that they can reliably predict, movies with a risk-free story, cast, and aesthetic. Of course, there's still plenty of room for amazing creative movies today. But as algorithms take over our lives, I wonder if we'll ever miss out on the next Napoleon Dynamite because the algorithm didn't know who to recommend it to. Or maybe the next Napoleon Dynamite will just get siloed into a specific indie niche, instead of getting discovered and adored by a large mainstream audience. So I'm hoping we keep valuing word of mouth and other people's recommendations, because that opens us up to finding the next great thing that breaks our algorithm. And in that spirit, I highly recommend Napoleon Dynamite. And I hope this video was a good recommendation for you. This is pretty much the worst video ever made. Napoleon, like anyone can even know that. If you want to take more control over your algorithm and help me out in the process, consider hitting the subscribe button below. I've got more videos in the pipeline that I think you'll like, and I also really, really want a million subscribers. So thanks for watching, and thank you to my Patreon supporters. I couldn't do this without you.